Good morning. So happy you could join us today and worship with us. We uh, have two more, including this one, in our series on Timothy. Um, I will be gone on Memorial Day weekend, so we'll just do kind of a one-shot sermon after our series in uh, Timothy, and then I'll start up in June with another series. Uh, I am taking, my parents have graciously agreed to take me and the kiddos, mainly for the kiddos' sake, to Disney World. And so we're going to be gone down there for about 10 days. And so uh, a man by the name of Jim Nash is going to come over who used to preach at Cornerstone over in Effingham, uh, but is connected to Lincoln. And he's also, during Sunday school, going to do a presentation for Lincoln to kind of give you an update on what's going on with them, with their changes, so that way you all know. So if you're in one of the adult Sunday school classes, I ask that if you are willing that you would come and hear Jim Nash talk about uh, Lincoln during Sunday school uh, rather than have your normal Sunday school class so we can kind of see what that ministry is doing. And so I, I hope that you can come and support him and listen to him preach on Memorial Day weekend. Well, as I was looking at the text today and I was thinking about it, I, I started thinking of this question of how do we treat others? And it, it kind of reminded me of when I was a kid. Now, I've talked before about my dad and how my dad was raised in the Deep South and was kind of strict and, you know, just uh, a little more about manners and politeness than maybe a normal parent in our uh, country often is, especially even for Midwest standards. He was kind of fairly strict, uh, especially for my generation. Um, in fact, you know, things like, you know, you couldn't even get up to go use the restroom from the dinner table and said, unless you said, uh, may I please be excused from the dinner table, sir? You know, like before you could even like get up to go to the, and, uh, to the bathroom or something like that. Like that was just, and it wasn't that he was like mean. He just like, that was how he was raised down in the Southern Arkansas. And that's how he raised does, even though I grew up, you know, I was born in Alma, Illinois, which isn't far from here, and it's not quite the same level of politeness and manners that the people in Alma had, not that they were wrong, but he just grew up in a different area at a different time. Well, in that, though, I was definitely brought up to have these kind of strict set of manners, and uh, it was always brought up as a way of you respect all people, it does until they've proven that they aren't to be respected, your baseline is respect. And that's really what those manners were about because I was taught, and I've kind of broken myself of this now uh, somewhat, that it doesn't matter the age, you call all men sir, you call all women ma'am. Well, I have found out, especially after entering adulthood, a lot of women don't like being called ma'am. And so I have learned not to just assume to call women ma'am because they often don't like that. And so out of respect, I do now, I've unlearned that trying. But even today, because I was, I was, this was fresh on my mind, I noticed that I called like three or four guys, sir. And I don't think I have to call them sir, but it's just this ingrained thing in me that you show respect whenever you treat people in a certain way. And until they've proven that they don't deserve that respect, that's what you do. You just show respect to people. And one of those things is to say, sir. And it also includes, you know, excusing yourself or saying thank you or please or you're welcome. And and I probably do that even more than I even have to in situations that you don't really need to say it, but it's just so ingrained from in me from the moment I started talking that that is what you do. And I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. Now, uh, was it to the extreme sometimes? And maybe I don't do it in all circumstances. You know, like if my kid wants to go up to the bathroom while they're eating, I normally ask them to like tell me what they're doing, like why they're getting up. So I know they're not just like going to start running in circles around the table or something like that. But I don't make them call me sir whenever they tell me like, hey, I'm going to the bathroom. (laughs) You know, but it's good to let people know. But I appreciate what he instilled in me. Because I do think there's something good about that and how we treat others and how we do it with a certain set of manners and respect towards others. And that's kind of what our passage today is about. It's how are we treating others? What are the the guiding principles behind treating certain groups of people? Now, he does do an overall kind of some thing in the beginning, but very specifically, he talks about specific groups of people. How are we to treat them? 
So let's go ahead and dive into the text and let's look at kind of what we're going to see and how we're treating those. And that first thing that we're going to see is how we treat each other. That's the general one that we're going to do. So if you have your Bibles with you, it's going to be uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5 is where we're going to spend most of our time today. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, I'm going to read the first two verses. Do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father, younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters, in all purity. So if we look at this, what does it tell us about treating other people? Well, the first thing it says that is that we should encourage each other not to rebuke each other. Now, we have to understand a little bit of what these words mean. And so with rebuke, when we look this up and understand what rebuke means, it really, what it has is this context of you censor someone, but you do it very severely. Like you, you don't allow them to speak or you don't allow them to do what they're doing, but you do it in a very severe way. You really come down hard on them. And so what he's saying is, if you want to correct someone, because that's what he's talking about here is correction, don't come down on them hard. Don't just try to censor them, prevent them from speaking, prevent them from acting, but encourage them. And when we look at encouragement, we see that to encourage is to earnestly support or to encourage, with a, or to encourage a response or an action. So you're trying to encourage a very specific action that you're doing. So you see the wrong that someone's doing and you try to correct them. And instead of rebuking them, you're wanting to encourage the right action, you know? And you see this with children a lot, don't you? Whenever sometimes with children, they're like, well, if you just get on to them, they're not really listening. They just like feel sad about it or they feel mad. Sometimes what you have to do is instead give them the right action to do and then encourage that. So that way they do the right thing rather than just trying not to do the wrong thing. And that's one of the things they tell you with parenting is like, try to get them to do the right thing, not just not to do the wrong thing. (laughs) And then you kind of just substitute that in. And it's the same thing with adults too. Often, you know, you attract a lot more flies with honey than you do vinegar or something. And it's because you do better with people. People want to hear encouragement more than they want to hear rebuke. And this was true in Paul's days too. I, I think this has been true ever since humanity existed. People want to hear encouragement more than they want to be rebuked. Now, there is a time for being rebuked. Don't get me wrong. You know, the the Bible even says, even 2 Timothy says that, you know, that all scripture is useful for a few things, but one of those few things is rebuking. And I think even if you look at, I you know, said for existence of humanity, if we look all the way back in the Garden of Eden, what do you think God was doing to Adam and Eve after they sinned? He rebuked them. (laughs) You know, I mean, sometimes that is necessary. But sometimes we tend to jump right into rebuking, but we haven't even tried encouragement yet. And so what we need to remember is sometimes we just need to encourage. And really, when we look at this passage, the, the whole older men as fathers and younger men as brothers and, you know, older women as mothers and younger women as sisters... That's just kind of like helping them understand how to treat. It's not really the core of the text, but whenever I was looking, a lot of people kind of focus on that. But if you look into like the grammar of the text and everything like that, really what the focus is, it could just as easily say, encourage each other in all purity. That's really the sentence. The other stuff is just descriptors. And so really what we're commanded to do there is to encourage each other in all purity. Now then the question comes into what is purity? Well, purity is cleanliness. It's not being soiled or not being tainted by something. Well, very specifically, we often see this in the context of uh, sexual sins. That's, that's often where we see this. But it doesn't have to just be that. In fact, in you know, Psalms, one of my favorite verses is Psalms 119.9. It says, how can a young man keep his way pure by living according to God? Well, he's not talking about sexual sin there. He's just talking about living in godliness, living a pure life. And so when we see the word purity, we automatically jump to sex often, but it doesn't have to be that jump. 
Really what he's talking about is pure motives or good intention, godly intention. And so whenever we encourage each other in all purity, it's encourage each other with godly motives. Like we're doing it to help them be clean, to help them be righteous. We, that's what we want for them. Now, uh, I do think the part that he gives, like specific example, is, has some importance. I don't think it's bad that he says older men like fathers and so on. But I don't think that's the point of the text. I think the point is that we encourage in all purity. But why does he say treat each other like family? Because he does say it. And I think he does that because at our core, most people want what's best for their family. Even if like you're a little annoyed with them, you don't want to see bad things happen to them. And so he's telling you, like with the older men, don't be rebuking them, but treat them as if they're your biological father. You want what's best for him. You want to do right by him. For the younger men, because Timothy was a younger man too, so he says, treat them like your brothers. Like you, even if you're annoyed with your brother, you don't want him to get hurt. You don't want something bad to happen to him. Same way with older women as your mother. You know, you don't want anything bad to happen to your mom. And with younger women, like your sister, you know, if you have a sister, you don't want anything bad to happen to her. You want, you want good things for them. And so it's the same thing here. We encourage because we want what's good for them, what's best for them. And what's best for them is for them to be lined up with God. And so we treat them with kindness and pure motives and respect and encouragement why? Because we want to correct the things that could separate them, could soil them, could taint them, and prevent them from having that relationship with God. And so we encourage. And so when we look at each other out in the audience, when it says how we should treat each other, it's talking about the person who's sitting in the row behind you or in front of you, or, or next to you. It doesn't really matter. The point is, he's talking about the church. Within the church, how do we respond to each other? With encouragement. In all purity. We want what's best for people. And we don't rebuke because we're, we're trying to encourage and bring you along in kindness and trying to, like, not drive a wedge in between us because they're just mad at how we did something and that's often what rebuking produces is they just get mad at you you don't get the desired effect that you want and so that's hard to do sometimes though because sometimes you see what someone is doing is wrong and you're like are you dumb why are you doing that <laughs> you know and you just want to kind of tell them off because you're like I, I don't understand why you're doing this you know this the bible clearly says this but then the Bible clearly says to encourage too. And then we have sometimes to check ourselves. We're like, are we doing what the Bible clearly says? And so sometimes we need to realize that while we might want to rebuke, if you haven't tried encouragement first, then rebuking is probably not the right response. And so you sometimes need to just take a moment, maybe calm yourself and encourage. But now we get into that kind of the specific groups that Paul wants to talk about. And these probably were specific issues that were going on in the church of Ephesus, and that's why he's addressing these specific things. But that doesn't mean that we can't still learn from them, even if they were just very specifically for Ephesus. But uh, if we look at this, the next thing is how we treat our widows. So in 1 Timothy 3 and 4, and then we'll skip over to verse 8 and verse 16, because some of what he does in between there is he's telling you uh, what qualifies a widow and that is a lot more cultural, you know, to them. And also uh, kind of the way they did it, like one of the things, even for younger widows, like in that culture, they couldn't really get jobs or something like that. So it's like, you know, they just need to find a new husband was kind of what I was saying, because women couldn't really work. Now, honestly, that's a cultural thing because women, if you don't, if you're a young widow, you probably can just work and get a job and support yourself. I mean, it's kind of like, that's kind of the way it goes nowadays. And so, but we want to address kind of like, how do you treat a, a widow within the church that maybe can't, for whatever reason, support themselves? And so where are we at with that? And so in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 3 and 4, and then 8 and then 16, it says, honor widows who are truly widows, 
But if a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness to their own household and to make some return to their parents, for this is pleasing in the sight of God. And then jumping down to verse 8, it says, But if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Then jumping down to verse 16, it says, If any believing woman has relatives who are widows, let her care for them. Let the church not be burdened, so that it may uh, care for those who are truly widows. Now what they're saying here is it's not saying that the church doesn't want to help widows. But he's saying something about how it should help them because the church can't help everyone. Now the first thing is just a general statement to widows, and that is that uh, they should be honored and honor here is a very specific word they use for honor here. It does re mean respect, but it means that you have respect for someone enough that you're going to set an appropriate price to that. So it does have a financial element to this word honor. And so th this context here is not just honor in the way we think of it, because we think of honor as almost like a one-for-one -for, -one for respect almost. But this one very much is like, you honor the merchant by offering a good price. You're, you're very much like, you're not going to like belittle their product or belittle what they are. You're not going to undershoot what it's worth, but you're going to honor them by giving a correct price for it. And, and that's very much the context of this word. If you look in Greek culture, when that word was used, it was very much in that transactional type of language. And so when we see this, when he uses this word, I think the people of that day would have automatically understood he's talking about financial responsibility. Are you taking care of the widows? Are you granting them with the resources they need to survive? And so that's what he's talking about. In fact, we see this in other parts of the Bible too. We see this in James chapter 1. The very end of James chapter 1, it says in verse 27, religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father, is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. How, how do you have pure religion? You visit the widows and the orphans. But I think it was more than just like, oh, I showed up at their house because it says in their affliction. I think there's very much another element of that where you actually visited them and you were doing stuff for them when you visited. That's pure religion. And then if we jump over to Acts, the whole office of a deacon within the church was designed and started for this very purpose, for widows. So if we look at Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 3, it says, Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists, and the Hellenists are just the Greek Christians. Helen, Hellenist is another word for Greek Hellenists arose amongst the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve, the disciples, apostles, summoned the full number of the disciples and said, it is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. And just to give you a little insight that serve tables is the word deacon. That's, that's where we get the word deacon from. Serve tables. Therefore, brothers... Pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we'll be, we will appoint to this duty. So why do we have deacons? To minister, to serve widows. And not just widows, but different people, needs of the church, basically. what The physical needs of the churches. And this distribution was a distribution of food and resources, what they needed to survive. So they could continue living. And there were some, some people within the early church that needed help, but the, the apostles were being burdened by this. And they're like, listen, we need to teach. We can't constantly be bogged down by this, like the physical needs. We need to take care of the spiritual needs. And so we're going to appoint these seven people to care, take care of the physical needs. And they're going to take care of that for us. So we don't have to worry about that anymore. And so they appointed these deacons. And so that's, that's kind of the context and where we're at and how you know, Paul's thinking. And so then he says that uh, widows should be taken care of, but very specifically, widows should be taken care of by their families. 
Now, this is still within the church context. He's talking to believers. So he's talking to widows who are believers and families that are believers. And he's saying, listen, if you're a believer and you, your mom or grandmother, the, her husband has passed away, she can't like get a job or maybe can't work or something like that. It is your responsibility to financially take care of her. And if you're not, notice what he says in verse 8. In, in 1 Timothy uh, chapter 5, verse 8, he actually says, But if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. That's pretty harsh words. Pretty harsh right there. Now, I do realize that people of this day and age, they didn't have social security. You know, they didn't have medical insurance that was going to, you know, help cover something. They didn't even really have life insurance or something like that. So it's not like they were, they got money whenever their husband passed away or something like that. So I realized that the context and the culture was different. And I do understand there's an element of, you know, older people that their spouses pass away have a better way of taking care of themselves a lot of times nowadays. And that's fine. I'm not saying that those things are necessarily a bad thing. But there's still needs that need to be met. And if you have a family member that isn't able to take care of yourself and you're not trying to meet those needs, then there's a problem there. Because we should be taking care of our immediate family first, making sure they're good, before we even branch out into the other things. Your, your first area of responsibility are those in your household. And th that includes you know, their physical needs, their spiritual needs, their emotional needs, what, whatever it may be. That, that's your first area of priority. That's where you should be focusing some of your time. And so we show them godliness and we show our personal faith by taking care of those in need, especially within our own family. But he does understand that sometimes widows are without families that can take care of them. And in today's day and age, maybe it's because they live on the other side of the country and they can't get back like they could because of their job. Or in this day and age, it was normally because of some tragedy or something like that, and they literally had no family. And so maybe they never had children, or maybe the children died as well, and so they're kind of all alone. And so what do you do there? Well, in that day and age of the Bible times, they literally would probably starve. That, that, that's kind of where you're at. And Paul was saying that's not acceptable. And so in verse 16, while he does talk about how the relatives should take care of it, and says, let the church not be, be burdened so that they can take care of those who are truly widows. And what he's meaning here is those that don't have anyone to take care of them. Let the church take care of those people. Because he even understands, Paul does, that churches have limited resources. You know, we wish that the church could just take care of everyone. We, we find this in our benevolence ministry. Uh, whenever COVID happened, we, we wanted to help people because we understood some people were losing their job and it wasn't their fault even because, you know, the, the place is just shut down. And so we would have multiple people coming to us asking us for help. And we helped for, you know, the first month, like we were just helping anyone we could. We had, luckily we had a little bit of store in our benevolence fund, but that ran out really quickly. <laughs> and we were like, okay, this is a problem. And so I remember we kind of had a discussion, myself and the elders, and we were kind of like, uh, and we were talking and we we're like, okay, we need to set like a limit, you know, on like how much we give each person a month because it's just, we, we need to help as many people as we can. We just can't help everyone. And so we set that to $200 thinking that will cover most utility bills or something like that. If something would to happen and you can't pay your gas bill or you can't pay your water bill or water bill or whatever it may be, you can, we'll probably be able to cover that. And it can take a good chunk of your rent if you, you know, need help paying your rent or it can buy you groceries or, you know, whatever it may be. But, you know, we, we were just like, we just have too many people coming to us right now. And it was a good thing we did that because we were able to help more people. Now we couldn't just help someone entirely, but we were able to help more people through that. But I also kind of wonder, now a lot of these people were not widows, but imagine if they, the people had families that were able to take care of them 
rather than the church having to do it, then we could have used our resources just for those that were most in need. But instead, we had to put limits on it in order to kind of spread it out to more. And, that, and that's kind of what he's dealing with here, is that he, he realizes, Paul does, that there's limits to the financial ability of the church. That you want to help out as many people as you can, but because there are limits, we need to put some guidelines on who the church is helping, especially with widows, those that are truly in need, truly desolate, can't help themselves. And so he's saying, if they have family that are believers, they should help them. Let them take over. Let the church help those that don't have that. And so that's kind of the guidelines that he sets. And he's not doing that out of lack of care for anyone. He's just doing that out of practical understanding of how money works. <laughs> it's it just knowing that there's a, a, it's a finite resource. It doesn't last forever. Now we get into kind of the bulk of the text here, and it's the how we treat the elders. Now, there's a lot packed into a few verses here. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read the verses, but then we're going to kind of unpack. And it says, Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. For the Scripture says, You shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain, and the laborer deserves the wages. Do not admit a charge against an elder except for on the evidence of two or three witnesses. As for those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all, so that the rest may stand in fear. Okay. In just those few verses, I see three things that it says about elders. And, you know, sometimes it's just like bang, 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 like how Paul talks. And sometimes it's like he takes... 10 sentences to say one thing. And so you never know how Paul's going to do. But here it's just like bang, 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 just rapid fire here. And so the first one is that uh, there are situations where elders preach. For whatever reason, maybe you don't have a preacher, or in that day and age, you didn't really have people that were paid just to be preachers. And so what often happened, since the elders were in charge of the doctrine of the church, making sure that correct teaching was being happened, one of the elders would kind of be the primary teacher for the church, the one that would get up in front of people. And they're saying like, listen, that's a hard job. It's not an easy job to prepare something to, be, to teach. And if they're doing that, if they're taking time out of their own personal lives at that time, pretty much everyone who was doing that had another job. They were bivocational. They're like, they should get paid for their effort. <laughs> you shouldn't expect them just to get up and take hours out of their week, hours out of their family time to prepare a sermon, to prepare teaching, and just think, oh, that's okay, they can do that. They, they should get paid. Now, in today's culture, it is a little different. Now, I do get paid for preparing a sermon, but I'm also not an elder. And so I don't, this does, passage doesn't really apply to me. It's not talking about me here. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't pay me. That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> but it just means that there, this is the passage why some people do, whenever they hire a senior minister, they automatically make them an elder. That happens more in like Baptist churches than it does in the Christian church. Traditionally in the Christian church, that has not been the way. And part of that's because the, the, the role that I fill in the church can be like one of three things in the Bible, and it's, it's unclear of exactly what it is, but it's either that you're a deacon who is in charge of the ministries that also preaches, or you're an evangelist like Philip in Acts, or you're an elder who also preaches. And so the question is, how do you see the minister? <laughs> and, and the answer is honestly a little bit of all three. <laughs> and, and that's kind of the role we fit. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that, but it does make it to where it's a little more gray in what the minister does in the church. And, uh, and so that's why uh, ministers don't necessarily have to be elders, but they can be elders. It's kind of like one of those things. And so, uh, but if you do have an elder who is taking the time to preach, that should not be just expected because they're an elder. They should have some benefit to that. And that's what he's saying here. 
Now, that's not the part that I want to kind of spend the majority of my time about elders on. I just wanted to kind of address that because I know it's why uh, I prefer not to be called pastor because pastor is another word for elder, and I am not an elder here, so therefore prefer if you just don't call me pastor. Um, in fact, I've had people that want to call me pastor. I never make a fuss about it, but I am always, if they ask me, I'm like, just call me Nathan. Nathan's good. I, I don't need a title. <laughs> just, I don't need one of those. And so, but if you, if someone calls me pastor, or if you've been guilty of calling me pastor, it, that's fine. It's, it, it's okay. <laughs> but the pastor would be someone like in uh, 1 Timothy 5, 17. The second thing that says is an elder should be protected from false or frivolous accusations. An elder has a hard job. They're responsible for the doctrine of the church, responsible for the spiritual life of every single person within the church. And to be honest, uh, someone who's responsible for the doctrine and teaching of the church, the Bible actually says that they're going to be judged more harshly whenever they go to heaven. <laughs> so it's not an easy thing. <laughs> and as such, there needs to be a level of protection for elders with this type of thing. And so what it's saying is that since elders are you know, have a hard job, and they're a little more vulnerable because of their place of leadership, um, and they're, because they're more visible. Sometimes people want to kind of take them down a notch just because they're the people in charge, even if they don't have good reasons. You need to make sure that they're accused in the right way. And so that's why it makes very clear, and even though in the Bible it talks about how it's good to have two or three witnesses even whenever you... Uh, approach other people with sin. But it also says in the Bible that if you, someone has sinned against you, you, you alone can go and talk to that person. But here it's just saying, whether any accusation is made, we need to have two or three witnesses. Because we need to make sure we're protecting our elders. And they do that because when we look at elders... Since they are more visible and they are more in leadership, they also face not only the normal amount of temptations that you face every day, but I'll be honest, they get opposition from Satan probably a lot more than the standard Christian does. And the reason why is because if they can be taken down, then Satan knows how much that's going to hurt the church because they're the leaders. And so we don't want a bunch of false accusations because all that's doing is hurting the reputation of an elder. And even if they're not true, what's going to happen is their reputations could be ruined from it. And then what's happening is that church is going to suffer. And then even if it's proven that the accusation was false, that's probably never going to fully recover. And so what's going to happen is Satan's going to have a victory there. It may be a small victory, but it's still a victory, and it's going to end up being kind of one in his, his camp. And, and we don't want that. We don't want Satan to have any victories, especially not against a leader within the church. And so he's saying, like, unless you have two or three witnesses, unless you're for sure that there's something going on there, we don't need to be accusing them of something. We need to have that little hedge of protection for them. But it doesn't stop there. It says that if an elder is sinning, they must be rebuked. Now remember what it said at the beginning of this chapter. Don't rebuke, but encourage. We get to the leaders and all of a sudden it's, if they're still sinning, and notice that it's the persist in sin, it's not just like, oh, they sinned and we, we called them out on it and they've repented. That's not what he's talking about. It's someone who they've been confronted and they will not stop sinning. They persist in their sin. If you see someone like that and you see an elder like that, then they need to be rebuked because of their role of leadership. It cannot be taken lightly. And so this is where it gets a little hairy because it says that they need to be confronted if it's continuing sin. But it's not just that. It's not just that they're rebuked, but it's very clear that it's supposed to be a public rebuke. Not just you go to them in private. Timothy or Paul is clear in verse 20. It says, As those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all. Not 
pull them aside and talk to them. In the presence of all, rebuke them. And that seems harsh, doesn't it? And at first we're like, man, that's, that's harsh. But then you start thinking about it and you start thinking about why they needed the protection was because of their area of leadership. And it starts making you realize that that's why they need public rebuking as well. Because of their area of leadership. Sometimes, and I've said this before, if we keep sin hidden, God, or Satan can use it to destroy things. But if we put the sin out in the light, then God can use it for something good. Because God can use all things for the good of those who love him. And whenever you rebuke an elder, a leader, in private, what happens if it gets out and the church didn't know? You just covered something up for one of your leaders. And that's a problem. It needs to be public. And sin can't be allowed to grow within the church. So you need to make that example of like, listen, a leader was caught in sin, they need to be, re- this thing happened at a church I was a part of in Kansas City. One of the elders was caught in an affair. And they, they asked him to come forward and to repent on a Sunday morning. And he wouldn't do it. So that next Sunday, the other two elders and the minister got up and they and told the entire church what was happening and that he refused to repent. Now, it seemed harsh because that person wasn't there either because he refused to come, but it also destroyed his marriage and he had two junior high girls that, and it destroyed their relationship with him. You know, I mean, it was just a, a horrible situation. They kept on coming to church there. We, they, the elders, of course, told the wife that they were doing it and said, we would understand if you don't want to be here this Sunday because it could be hard, you know, but like, we have to do this. I mean, that's what the Bible says to do. And so they did it. And I respect the elders of that church for doing that. And after that moment, we actually had a period of strong growth right after that. And it's amazing because you would think like, oh, people might be thinking like, do I want to be in a church that's like calling people out for their sin? And you might think that people might shy away, but it was the exact opposite. Like, okay, they hold their leaders accountable. That's the type of place I want to be a part of. And it's amazing whenever you do things the way that the Bible says to do them, how much growth you can have, whether it be numerical or spiritual. It's because God, it's almost like God knows what he's talking about. (laughs) And so if we follow him often, we experience the blessings from it. And so we see that here, that we should rebuke them. And we do this because the leaders, they protect doctrine and they shepherd the spiritual lives of the members of the church. And so if they're caught in sin, it needs to be made aware that we caught this person in sin. They They didn't repent. They continued to do it. We are still looking out for you all. We're still protecting doctrine. We're still shepherding your spiritual life. But we cannot allow this to persist. And so an example has to be made. And so when we look at this, it's hard. And so what I want to encourage you with here is that, you know, we talked about the qualifications for an elder. We talked about how they want to be, uh, they need to want to be an elder. And I think, you know, people should strive to be an elder. I think it's a good thing to strive for. But I also think that as members of the church, we need to recognize just how hard of a job an elder is. And sometimes be maybe a little more respectful (laughs) towards them. Be a little bit more honoring. Maybe be a little bit more kind and thankful (laughs) for the job they do because they have a hard job. But it also means that whenever we do things, we want to do things as biblically as possible. And if that means that we have people to take care of in our home, we take care of them. If it means that there's someone in our community or our church that needs to be taken care of that doesn't have someone, we take care of them. And if it means that someone's caught in sin that's in leadership, they're confronted if it's proven that they are in fact caught in sin, maybe even a bit harshly. But I promise you, if we do it the way that Paul has laid out here through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, God will bless us for it. 
And I think that's what we all want. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you lay things out for us. Tell us how we should do things, even if it's hard sometimes. And I pray that you just help us live faithfully and live out your word to the best of our ability. I want to pray especially for the elders here, Don, Dwayne, and Sam. Uh, I pray that you protect their hearts and protect their faith, that you give them encouragement that they need and the strength they need to continue to lead. I myself am thankful for their leadership and their faithfulness to you, and um, I just pray that you help them resist any temptation or opposition from Satan, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.